Okay, everybody. Hi, and welcome to a special curated chat between myself, Dr. Peter Johnston, and my colleague, Kirsty Parsons. We're curated here at the National Army Museum, and we have been doing a lot of work on the history of the British Army. And obviously, today is a very significant day in that history. And Kirsty's here to tell us a little bit more about it. So, Kirsty, hi. Thanks for thanks for coming in and uh, and joining us via this new technology that we're sort of getting used to. Uh, we hope it's really enjoyable for you guys at home. Uh, but please do bear with us if there are any technical issues. So, Kirsty, obviously, tell us a little bit about today. What, what are we doing today? Why are we commemorating today? So today is the anniversary of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen um, concentration camp in Germany. And one of the reasons that we at the National Army Museum are focusing on this uh, liberation in particular is because this was very much a British Army liberation. Um, and the anniversary of this liberation is today, the 15th of April. Um, and it happened in 1945. So before we get to the, the events of, of 15th April 1945, um, perhaps you can provide a little bit of background to, to, to Belson, you know, as, as a place and, and as a camp and, and, and where, when it had been established and, and everything there. Yeah, sure. So Belson was established in 1940 as an allied prisoner of war camp uh, before it became a concentration camp um, after it was turned over to the SS in 1943. Um, during this period, civilians with uh, foreign passports were held there as to use as potential leverage for exchanging uh, with German uh, prisoners kept in allied countries. Um, towards the end of the war, as I said, it became um, a collection camp for Jewish prisoners evacuated from camps closer to the front um, as the Allied and the Soviet forces um, advanced across Germany. And uh, thousands of new prisoners arrived on foot uh, from the east, overwhelming the uh, already inadequate resources uh, at the camp. And they joined um, current Jews who were held there. Um, as well as other categories of people that the Nazis had singled out, including gypsies, uh, criminals, political prisoners, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals, um, all these types of people in one place. And um, by the end of July 1944, there were about 7,300 prisoners in the camp. Um, but by April 1945, this had increased to over 60,000. So just to give you an idea of just how many people were held there. Um, and before it was liberated, uh, about 50,000 people um, had died at Bergen-Belsen. And so obviously, you know, the, in this stage, the British Army is, is, is on its way, driving its way across Germany. It's crossed the Rhine. It's marching ever, ever, ever eastwards, the, the, the aim being to reach Hamburg and then, and then probably Berlin. But what British units are in the area, uh, what are they expecting to find as, as, they're, as they're advancing? Well, they certainly weren't expecting to find anything like um, Bergen-Belsen uh, or any concentration camps, really. We had Auschwitz being liberated in January, uh, 27th of January, 1945, um, and Buchenwald um, was liberated by the Americans on the 11th and 12th of April, 1945. But despite this, um, actually only a small number of people at the Foreign Office were aware of what was uh, happening in these, in these camps and that they, even that they existed. Um, a lot of people were unaware that they were even there. Um, and the British Army's 11th Armoured Brigade uh, had pushed forward into German-occupied Netherlands in, the late in late 1944. And by March 1945, they had crossed the Rhine. Um, and it, that was the unit that first occupied Bergen-Belsen, um, following some negotiations with the retreating Germans on 12th of April to surrender the camp peacefully. Um, they were told um, that there was a concentration camp in the area, um, but uh, where a serious outbreak of typhus had uh, become an epidemic. And so the deal that was struck was that if the British avoided fighting around uh, the Belsen area, um, therefore reducing the risk of prisoners um, roaming the countryside and spreading the typhus epidemic further, they would be offered another bridge over the uh, River Aller, which would be essential for the brigade's continued progress um, across Germany. And um, just to kind of give you an idea of how limited the information was at the time, just want to uh, Sheriff Lashmall, who was serving with the King's Royal Rifle Corps at the time. And so his memory of that sort of situation is this. Um, we were on our central line and suddenly we came to a halt. A German party came out and were referred to the commander and they had a message that it was important we didn't fight through this area. And we, to us down there, we didn't know what they were talking about. We didn't know if it was a lunatic asylum or something like that. It was an area which was unstable. Of course, it turned out to be Belsen Camp and then the way was cleared for medical units to go in. 
and then of course we realized so very much um, a situation where little information had been passed on great responsibility taken on by these units and not really knowing what they were going into um, so, it was, so what happened then when those when those first soldiers arrived you know that they've made this truce uh, the 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 Germans have agreed that they'll they'll hold the camp and then they'll withdraw in good order and the British can can some sort of take it over exactly as you say to stop it spreading. You know what do the what do the units actually arrive? What what do they do when they when they get there? Um, so as I said before, Eleventh Armoured Brigade were the first to cross the threshold, um, and yeah, what they found there was just beyond comprehension. I think for them. Um, more than 60,000 prisoners um, were in serious need of medical attention and um, more than 13,000 had already died, um, unfortunately, and were visible all around the camp. So they were, they were coming into a situation that they, I don't even think in their wildest imaginations they could have, they could have pictured. Um, that division was actually needed for the continued advancement of the British campaign across Germany. Um, so a relief operation was handed over to the Deputy Director of Medical Services for the British Second Army, which was uh, Brigadier Hugh Glynn Hughes. And the uh, main priorities that were set out for this liberation force um, were to bury the dead, contain the spread of disease and to restore the water and food supplies. Um, so this so this huge humanitarian crisis is unfolding and the British are undertaking sort of this big response to it whilst continuing to fight and continuing mm -hmm. to move forward. And I mean, that's surely that's quite amazing. I mean, there must be a huge scale of this operation to, 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 to tackle. Yeah, absolutely. And to have that situation where you go in and liberate this camp and experience the, the horrors that await you there and then to have to move on and, and put that behind you and, and carry on with a campaign must be... I, yeah, I can't even imagine how difficult that would be. Um, and it's, yeah, something that, that must, must have stayed in their minds for a very long time afterwards. And uh, yeah, to also to coordinate this operation, because we didn't, it wasn't just um, the army that were there, there were other medical units uh, from, we had Irish nurses, we had civilian medical students, um, all sorts of um, other medical teams that were brought in, but to coordinate this effort and take those priorities and, and fix on those and distribute them between different units must have been a huge undertaking. I mean, you had an ambulance unit who were evacuating and feeding the sick, um, and you had a casualty clearing station created in a hospital in the Panzer training barracks in, in Hona, and um, the field hygiene section were um, tasked with burying the dead. Um, in order to control the typhus epidemic um, that was out, out, outbreaking there. And, and I mean, how long did how long did all this this take? I mean, when were the British able to to bring at least some some sense of order to this this horrific scene? Mm, so actually, uh, impressively, it was days, not you know months, weeks. Um, so on the sixteenth of April were the first deliveries of food and water, with twenty seven water carts being brought in. Um, and this this actually this first uh, lot of delivery was brought in by eight corps um, who were one of the units that took part in operation plunder in 1945 uh, where they crossed the rhine occupying um, areas of germany um, and then uh, on the 18th of april medical teams arrived and started their work um, and as i said this response the speeders response was very good but um, despite this uh, the daily death rate at the camp was uh, 300 to 400 deaths a day, and it took about a month to reduce this down to less than 100 per day. Um, and as I said before, by um, by the time, uh, sort of within a month after the camp had been liberated, about 14,000 prisoners had died um, subsequently. So, Kirsty, after this absolutely gargantuan humanitarian effort that pulled in all those resources that you talked about, both that were in a core already, but then also back in the UK, what happened next? Um, so the last prisoner was evacuated to the new camp at Hona um, and the barrack huts were burned to the ground on the 21st of May, um, watched by uh, soldiers and former prisoners alike. And we have actually some fantastic photos of that in the collection, if you can say fantastic about that kind of uh, material. But um, I think they are definitely worth looking at. Um, also, the British uh, occupation authorities um, went on to establish a displaced persons camp um, housing over 12,000 survivors located near the original site of Belsen um, in a German military school. And the camp was in use until 1951. I mean, you've, you've talked about the absolute horror of this and 
you know what people found and, and we, we are familiar with the the absolute institutionalized savagery that the holocaust represented but you know how did the ordinary soldiers react do we, what do we know about how the ordinary soldiers reacted to the to these events mm. Well, here again, I refer to our own collection and as a historian, I always like to hand over to the people who actually witnessed these events as much as possible. Um, so I've got some quotes here from a soldier from 8th Battalion Middlesex Regiment, and uh, he wrote um, some uh, sort of views on his uh, first impressions of Belson. I'll just read those to you now. Now he says, I had spent three hours amongst 50 people who appear more dead than alive children who without surprise with all hope gone from white hollow-eyed faces totter in filthy rags over the black befouled mud where the air is heavy with the smell of death a true dante's inferno created not by the imagination but by nazi germany a creation beyond the imagination in its beastliness this is belson concentration camp as i saw it on sunday the 22nd of april approximately a week after its liberation and interestingly he's got liberation in quote marks so fascinating and so i mean obviously lots of soldiers were therefore you know from different parts of the army were actually were actually going to see this you mm. know i mean that, that's that's amazing in itself you know that, that no one could have imagined it and yet people sort of wanted to go and, and go and see it with their own eyes i guess yeah, within a week of the camp being liberated, other army, British army units were encouraged to go see it. And actually the British army made the local German community go to the camp and see what happened there as well. And I mean, have you actually visited, you know, have you visited Belson, Kirsty? I mean, do you, you know, what did you, you know, what were your impressions of the visitor being able to walk around there now, you know, so many years on from, from the horrific events that we've, that we've described and, and, and heard documented? Mm. Yeah, so um, as part of um, an exhibition which will be opening at National Museum in May, um, I went to do some contemporary collecting there around, um, uh, in Germany, uh, more widely around the British Army experience of serving there. And as part of that, we were able to travel to Bergen-Belsen, the camp, and um, look at the museum that they've built there, the visitor centre and the camp itself. And I've, I always find this bit of the trip quite difficult to describe. The only way I can think to describe it is that... Um, we were there and, uh, you know, throughout the rest of the day, we've been quite chatty, you know, traveling in the van, you have to get on quite well with the people you're with. So we'd been chatting and talking about work and other things, um, just getting on really well. And then we, we reached the camp and we started to get a bit quieter. We had a tour from the curator um, through the visitor center, through the museum, talking about how they curated difficult histories like that. And we just, as the visit went on, we got quieter and quieter. And by the time we were, um, given the chance to explore the, the, what's left of the grounds and um, the burial mounds, we were just absolutely silent. We, we weren't really saying anything and occasionally we were pointing things out, but I think it's that atmosphere that I take away most from that visit. And I, yeah, I'm afraid I can't really describe it in any other way except just how quiet we were and how deeply we were thinking about everything we were seeing and experiencing. I mean, oh, on, on that note, I mean, I, I... You, you sort of said it, but you know, you, obviously, 70, 75 years on, you know, we, we talk about the army's role, but you know, why should why should why do you think we should remember Belson and, and what the army did and, and what happened there? Mm, I think seventy five years on, we uh, there's this need to tackle this identity based hostility within our society. It still remains prevalent now, and that's one of the reasons why the Holocaust happened in the first place. And commemorating anniversaries like this really help us to remember our shared history and provide us an opportunity to reflect on events like this. Um, and actually, I'd like to utilise another quote from that uh, soldier from the Middlesex Regiment I quoted earlier, because um, I think uh, we hear a lot about fake news at the moment and how um, some events are, uh, are sort of um, put on the down low and tried not to talk about anymore. But I think... Um, <clears throat> there's a quote from his uh, archive which I think is quite uh, speaks to that quite well and he says um, so why did I visit Belson given the opportunity I went because I know that in a few years time only clever people will say nonsense don't you realize that was just wartime propaganda I shall know how to reply and the more who do the better for the peace of the world wow that's amazing even you know even then he was the, the, the risk of of, of fake news and, and misinformation being used to, to to cover up what happened he was uh, that person was already so attuned to it mm, um okay. you know obviously uh, as you were saying the, the camp that was set up at Hona, which became home to the the, the seventh armored 
uh, division and, and then brigade for so long in, in Germany. You know, Belsen was on the doorstep of the army for so long. And, um, you know, so many other soldiers came through in the de decades afterwards. And I, I think you said earlier that you, you, had, a, uh, you, had, a, you had a poem from, from someone who, who went there. I was wondering perhaps if you'd, you'd share that for everybody watching. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd, um, yeah, again, like to pass over to those who actually experienced it. So I'm happy to end on that note. So, yeah, the Siddhis was written um, by Anthony Rawlings of the 7th Armoured Division. Uh, it was published in the Jewish Chronicle in 1955 and he wrote it in 1951. And uh, so this is it. The silence of this place where no birds sing, this pit of hell where trees enshroud as walls to hide the shame. These tragic mounds of earth, each one marked with symbolic death, here lie 5,000 dead, just that, no more. Theirs was no thrilling battle cry, no bugle sounding the night quickened their breath or touched their souls to challenge immortality. Only the whispers of the winter leaves the soft pale whispers on the lips of death, blown by the wind across our feet. The earth is wet with tears, marking dark river, rivers in these paths of mud. There stands their shrine, these nameless ones, a lonely finger pointing to the sky, the conscience of the world, a sallow stone, the sorrow of the world written in blood. Wow. Thanks, thank you for that. Um... Uh, ladies and gentlemen watching at home, I hope you've really enjoyed it. Um, I'd like you to give a, a virtual round of applause for, for Kirsty and all the, the wonderful things that she shared with us about what was a truly horrific event, but still something that we should commemorate today and something that, you know, the National Army Museum is very proud to, that we are able to tell this story uh, and talk about the Army's role uh, in liberating this camp and, and everything that it did in the general drive to victory in 1945. Uh, there's going to be a Q&A live on, on Twitter later that we hope you'll join us for and, and Kirsty and I will do our best to answer your questions. So if you've got any follow up points or anything like that, we, we'd really love to see you there uh, and can't wait. So thanks very much for joining us uh, and I hope the conversation will continue online. Thanks very much. <laughs>